Okay, I'm here to talk about how to monitor fecal coliform bacteria. When they first asked me to do this, I thought it was for the industrial stormwater permit, but uh, I see there's a lot more um, municipal and other bacteria interests out there, but pretty much it all applies to any permit, uh, with the exception of the um, permit requirements, which I'll briefly summarize for the industrial permit. I'll also talk about effluent limits, and uh, a little bit about source identification sampling and microbial source tracking as additional tools uh, to help meet your permit requirements. But then I'll get into sampling procedures, analytical procedures, quality control procedures, and then of course data review and reporting. So the industrial permit requires a new sample for fecals that all outfalls are discharged to 303D listed category five waters. They're on the website and um, that frequency for the industrial permit is quarterly one just one sample per uh, outfall um, and until you re get consistent attainment of the effluent limit in four consecutive quarters methodology requires grab sampling for fecals not uh, composite sampling generally during business hours and within 12 hours of the uh, start of a discharge and the method, uh, the permit requires the membrane filter method to be used uh, with a detection limit of 20 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. The method also requires a maximum holding time of only six hours uh, and it's to be done by a lab laboratory that's accredited in Washington State for that specific method. Well, the effluent limits for TMDL waters are pretty much the water quality standards shown here. Most of our waters, uh, all our waters are classified uh, either by default or specifically as um, by the recreational use category. Most waters are extraordinary primary or primary contact shown in red for your single sample limit. So that's pretty much what your permit is since you're taking a single sample. You have to meet either 100 or 200 in your sample to be in compliance. There is some secondary contact waters, but not many. Um, I did throw up there what uh, beach closure standards typically are used to show how they are uh, quite different and higher than those that are in the water quality standards, but um, it's just an example of um, the different uh, criteria that are used in the state for identifying fecal coliform bacteria problems. I did note at the bottom here uh, in the industrial permit that there are no facilities um, currently that are required to do any additional sampling or effluent, uh, impose any effluent limitations related to TMDLs uh, for the industrial facilities. So it's just those in the 303D category 5 list. So a little bit uh, just about supplemental source sampling, you find a high bacteria in your outfall. Um, good uh, practice to get more than one sample to verify that that's not just a spurious uh, value. As we know, they're quite uh, variable bacteria concentrations, so you can do some supplemental grabs, uh, then track it upstream, um, look for uh, sanitary wastewater connections, sample uh, animal fecal deposit areas to see if they're a major source, look at roof drains, they're quite commonly a, a source. We did a study at SeaTac Airport and a microbial source tracking study and found a lot of birds and uh, found that uh, pigeon poop on the roof of the airport was uh, about an inch thick. So that was a nice source control. Street dirt and sweeper waste, as well as catch basin sediment sampling, sampling the solids uh, is also a nice way to uh, find sources. As Betty mentioned, uh, Fecal coliforms uh, can grow in um, nutrient-rich um, and particularly in shaded areas such as catch basins. So you can find those have been shown to be a big source. As well as wood waste and vegetation matter, uh, fecal coliform, um, even some of the coli, but principally the Klebsiella will grow in uh, these waste uh, to quite high levels and uh, you can sample those. And then of course there's looking at uh, bacterial removal rates in your structural BMPs upstream downstream to see what kind of removal you're getting from those. 
I had one uh, case study in, in Green Lake. We looked at Woodland Park, and we had really high bacteria levels uh, at the outfall going into Green Lake from the from this Playfield Park, uh, where our geometric mean was over 20,000 uh, CFU per hundred mil before we started. They went in and they uh, replaced a couple of these dirt soccer fields and converted them to synthetic turf, um, where the water came up clean, filtering uh, through the uh, turf media as well as removing this giant wood chip pile. It was a huge source. Uh, it turned out we did MST on that too, and it was 80% Klebsiella, and typically in your stormwater you're getting only, or less than 10% Klebsiella, so it was uh, obviously contributing uh, a lot of fecal coliform bacteria, and by removing those, we were able to get down to only 100 uh, CFU per 100 mil, just by removing those two sources. And just a little bit about microbial source tracking. I just finished uh, writing some guidelines for EPA. I'm using MST for TMDL development implementation where we reviewed all the uh, molecular methods and uh, it's a very good summary on the web page about um, the pros and cons, the costs, and availability of these methodologies. Principally, they break down into two types of methods, a library method and a non library method. The non-library less methods listed here, uh, bacterial dailies is, is most commonly used, but there's also enterococcus and virus DNA uh, testing using PCR, where they look at the DNA in the entire water sample and have markers uh, for selected numbers of sources. The methodology I use quite frequently here in the Northwest uh, is the E. coli DNA, uh, where it actually takes uh, isolates from your fecal coliform plate, um, isolates pure strains of E. coli, and then uh, check tests its DNA and matches it to a library um, that's over 200,000 organisms in it um, to identify what the fecal source is. But generally, this is an expensive uh, route to go, um, and there's quite a high level of uncertainty quite often um, for example, we just did a study in North Idaho rural streams where we used both the bacteroides and the uh, E. coli DNA. And with the bacteroides, we found no humans and no cows. That was what the laboratory was limited to identifying at the time, um, EPA's lab. And so it really came back kind of zero. It wasn't very helpful. Whereas the E. coli DNA, we found, in fact, that it was all wildlife. And we found the different uh, wildlife organisms. So. Um, but again, it's uh, an expensive process, and in fact, it's, it is accepted by some regulatory agencies outside Washington State, but I haven't found it very uh, accepted for use in our state, so that's somewhat limiting in terms of permit compliance. Uh, here's an example <clears throat> that we did in the watershed just north of here in the Green River for King County. Very extensive MST using E. coli. And it's just an example of some of the uh, results you get. Um, these are percentages of the different major groups of organisms. Whereas you look at your agricultural uh, stream, Newakum Creek, and um, in fact, we got quite a bit of livestock, 24%, but very few in these urbanized uh, creeks. And as Betty mentioned, we get mostly birds um, in urban areas, but also a lot of small mammals, and those small mammals are typically rodents. Rodents are. Um, always come up as a big source in these MST projects. All right, now I'm gonna get into sampling. Uh, that's really what they wanted me to talk about. And uh, I'll talk about techniques, supplies, containers, equipment, how to get a representative sample, and then some quality control procedures. Uh, Ecology has a couple of guidelines there um, that are recently produced that are very useful. One specifically for industrial facilities and, and then their standard operating procedures for monitoring fecal coliform that are useful. In their document, they show different sampling techniques uh, for different types of waters. And I brought some demonstration materials here. But uh, let's start first with the catch basin. Pretty much just move the lid uh, at the inlet lid and fill your water bottle. Uh, an existing ditch, sometimes you might have to deepen it to get it shallow enough, uh, deep enough to be able to, to uh, get your bottle in or you can create a sampling ditch in an overland flow situation in, in a grassy area to concentrate the runoff in one area. And then the overland flow from a parking lot uh, 
where you can berm it up to concentrate the flow, dig a pit at the edge of the pavement or in the pavement and uh, create yourself room to fill your bottle. And then the manhole, which is mostly what we do. One tool I use a lot is the trash grabber. It's nice for if you have short reach and uh, works very well. But for manholes, you need something like this. And um, it's a swing sample. And you can put your fecal bottle directly on it, create, use a zip tie that's um, already set to hold that bottle and slip it in there. And what they want you to do is sample uh, upstream so when you lower your hole, you're not dripping down water into the bottle. So go upstream and when it hits the water surface or the bottom, it'll, it'll tip over, fill up, sweep it up, and up it comes. You can also use a swing sampler with different bottles. So if you need to do a TPH sample, which uh, pretty much follows the same technique, you have a different uh, class that fits that bottle. And it goes. For your sampling supplies, Here's a quick list. Basically, you need your containers. Uh, I advise you to pre-label the bottles before you get them wet and bring spares in case you contaminate them or drop them down the manhole. And uh, bring your sampling equipment, some decontamination supplies, um, pen, logbook, cooler with ice, not blue ice, but actually ice cubes to get that sample down to two to six degrees C. Gloves to protect yourself as well as to keep um, from potentially contaminating the outsides of the bottle, and then some hand sanitizer. All right, sample uh, containers come in all shapes and sizes. Generally, we're looking for a 250 or 500 ml bottle. It can be either glass, as I showed you in that, or polyethylene, um, all in that other bottle. So they're autoclaved by the laboratory to provide them and they're sterile. You can also purchase sterile bottles online at a supply store, uh, such as the ones um, shown on the left, and or world pack bags, such as the ones shown on the bottom right. Um, they're also come sterile. You zip off the top, and um, you can fill them up. World pack even makes a nice little pole that holds these bags, so you can uh, have a bag holder and use those. On a, on a pole specifically made for world pack bags. Generally, we don't put preservative in stormwater samples. Uh, ecology recommends to use sodium thiosulfate, which we do for drinking water, but it's uh, to neutralize the chlorine, but that's not what we have a problem for in our, in our stormwater runoff. And um, they even recommend using EDTA to neutralize high metals concentrations, but you have to be over a milligram per liter, and, and that's not what you're gonna have to worry about. Okay, now the sampling equipment, um, which is where I was supposed to be demoing this stuff. Uh, but basically, ideally, you want to fill it directly by hand. That's the uh, most aseptic way of collecting your sample. But uh, you also might want to use that bottle clamp that I showed you, or the swing bottle holder like I showed you. And I mentioned the World Pack bag on the sampling pole in line. Generally, you don't want to use a dipper on a pole. Uh, because you need to decontaminate that. That's why you want to directly fill into the bottle. But um, in some cases, you have to. You're in a uh, storm pipe that the water's only a half an inch or a quarter inch deep. You're not going to be able to fill a water bottle, even if it's a wide mouth bottle. There's still too much, too little depth. So um, with the swing sampler, you can attach a pitcher uh, such as this. And you can get quite a bit of volume on there, but you may have to go get uh, some grabs to uh, bring up and fill your bottle directly. They also uh, don't want you to be using your pump tubing um, because of potential recontamination of the pump tubing. But in some cases, 
you have to. Um, you'll have your inline sampler, and you don't have access um, with a dipper. Um, and we'll, we'll use it on occasion. We'll use our automatic samplers. And make sure you flush that tubing at least with three volumes uh, of water before you collect your sample, and that that tubing you know, has been dedicated to that, that site. Okay, how to collect a represent sample. Basically, you want to collect it in turbulent flow, uh, preferably near mid-channel if you have a wide channel, ditch or stream, and don't disturb the sediment. Um, using aseptic techniques, basically, don't let the uh, cap rest on the ground like that and get dirty. If you have to set it down, uh, at least move it up and put it in a clean area, and don't touch the, um, the bottle rim. Don't rinse your bottle first. Um, orient your bottle upstream and stand downstream if you're in the channel. Plunge it to mid depth and sweep it up, leaving about a half an inch of head space in all your bottles. That's important for the laboratory to mix it up and get a good um, homogenized uh, sample to be count. If you do overfill it and you don't have preservative, you can just shake a little bit of water out and then you're good to go. Immediately put it in your cooler. It needs to be in the dark, around four degrees C. Um, get it, don't let it freeze. Uh, get it to the laboratory within six hours with a chain of custody, uh, requesting that they um, filter it immediately, and of course, give them warning. Uh, that helps. There is a field filtration and delayed incubation procedure in standard methods that I haven't used, but um, you can bring the field filtration apparatus and those. Uh, it has the media already in it, and it's pretty simple uh, with a field filter. And then you just uh, store those cultures, and they're good for three days until they incubate them at the laboratory. So that's a, uh, an option if you have trouble getting to the laboratory right away. Field quality control procedures. Detailed notes are good, especially if you're uh, changing uh, your procedures um, due to circumstances. Always the chain of custody, and on that chain of custody, uh, request the dilution volumes that you want them to run so you'll make sure you get a good count and you need to know what kind of levels you'd anticipate to get to do that, which I'll go over. And immediate analysis, and it's always also good, i found, to talk to the laboratory about the dilution volumes ahead of time. I've had laboratories ignore my request on the chain of custody forms. They just do what they traditionally do and sometimes don't look at those details. So. It's good to have good communication with your lab. Field duplicates are, uh, are good to do. There's two types. There's the split sample, and then there's the sequential grab. The split sample is where you fill one bottle, you shake it up, and you pour half out into another bottle, so you have you know, a split, uh, identical sample. And um, that measures lab precision. Uh, but if you want to look at variability in the water supply, in addition to lab precision, you just do sequential grabs. Uh, one uh, equipment decontamination we use, principally just to decontaminate our equipment uh, at the end of the day before we bring it back to the storeroom, is, is to use a 1% bleach solution and with a five minute contact time and then, and then rinse off that bleach. It's really not uh, recommended though to do that in say your sampling apparatus because uh, you have concerns of, you need to neutralize the chlorine um, and there's concerns about you leaving residual uh, materials. So really, I think just using a, uh, a liquid, an al alkanox uh, detergent rinse on your equipment is best um, if, you're, if you're using that to avoid um, potential residual decontaminants. Okay, laboratory procedures, I think I'm getting behind. It's Pretty much the membrane filter me method as Betty talked about, and they will fil filter basically between two and four different volumes of water to be able to capture the range of bacteria that may be in your sample. Um, ideally, uh, the method requires or uh, wants you to count between 20 and 60 colonies on a plate to get the most accurate uh, value. If it's less than 20, there's high variance. Um, in, in the count, higher variance in the count, and over 60, there's uh, crowding issues. Ultimately, though, counts over 200 should not be used because of, of, of the crowding issue. But as you can see in that table, you'll get a total range uh, that will encompass you know, 
know, all, all levels. Typically we're looking at 10 mils or more for storm water, 100 mils are for uh, drinking water. But in the ideal range, you'll get some, not, they don't overlap, and you'll get some uh, values that are, are considered to be estimates. Uh, the real, two common problems with the membrane filter method is confluent growth. A lot of fungus, in, especially in our storm water, will just overgrow the entire plate and they can't count anything. Um, or they'll be too numerous to count, it will be over 200 or the colonies will start growing together and you won't get a value. So the laboratory does do quality control procedures. Um, they do positive controls where they, they'll put in unknown um, quantities of bacteria to show that their media is working basically and they're required to do that as a method but they don't routinely report that to you. They will report negative controls which are essentially just blanks to show that their media is sterile. And uh, they'll also should be uh, doing at least uh, one laboratory duplicate uh, for each batch of samples. It may include your sample or it may not. If you wanted to include your sample, you need to ask them to. And then, of course, your uh, field duplicate uh, results. In general, uh, we like to do at least one field duplicate with every sampling event or at least every 20 samples if you're not collecting very many each time. And standard methods, uh, the method itself talks more about what quality control procedures. Okay, data review. This is important uh, to look at the data, uh, not just accept the values that the laboratory reports. Um, double check the holding time. And generally, that's from collection to delivery. And as long as they've analyzed it, you don't have to go on the clock on exactly when they filtered it. Um, a lower reporting limit is required at less than 20. Your negative control, if you get a hit in your blank, it's okay as long as all your values are at least five times greater than your, your blank value. But if not, then you have some uh, concerns about accuracy of your, of your values. Laboratory duplicates. Uh, different people have different relative percent, different goals. Uh, we use a 35% relative percent difference um, as an acceptable objective. Generally, that's similar to the 95% confidence limit of the membrane filter method at a count of 20. Um, but if you have very low counts, you don't want to use the percentage. It's biased. So if you have less than five times your reporting limit in your sample, you should be looking at more like plus or minus two times the reporting limit. And again, look at those raw data calculations, flag data if um, or correct data if they calculated them wrong, flag data if they don't meet your objectives, and also you can turn uh, two numerous accounts into a, a greater than value. So you just take if it's greater than if two numerous account it's greater than 200 at that lowest uh, sample vol filter volume. And same with the blanks. If you have all the uh, non hits, you can say it's less than your highest dilution volume. Here's a, a recent data review example for a stream uh, that's on base flow, and you can see, yes you can, I can't see it very well here, but the uh, values in pink are the ones that we use to uh, calculate the results. In this case, we, we had the lab filter 1, 5, and 50 mils, and in the first five examples, uh, we've got within that ideal range of 20 to 60, and we use that value and they calculated correctly, but then you see with the check marks. And then you see on the right that 1180, where well, they actually calculated 118. So they actually used uh, the 5 mil value, but used the 50 mil. So that was an incorrect calculation. And then the rest of them are pretty much the laboratory just picked the highest uh, count value, not using all the counts. So in this next example, uh, 0, 06 and 66, um, you need to add those three values up. Divide by the volume of those three uh, filter volumes to calculate the average result. And uh, they can be quite different than what the laboratory reports. Uh, reporting procedures for the permit. Uh, put all your sample results on your DMR. Include uh, field duplicates, but not any of the other quality control data. I advise to include your data flags to indicate values that are considered estimated and include geometric means if you do collect more than one um, and retain all your records. That's it. Questions?